Good evening, Methodist Temple, and welcome to worship. Merry Christmas! The wait is finally over. And hear me when I say this, that the wait is finally over, not just in some symbolic sense, in some poetic sense, not even just in a historical sense of something that happened a long time ago in Bethlehem, but the wait is over here and now among us, those who are gathered here to make worship possible, and all of us who are gathered in spirit at home, the wait is over because God has chosen once more to be with us. The wait is over because God has chosen to make God's self known in a human being again and again and again. And so we light our Christ candle, our final candle, on the Advent journey as a sign that God's light is truly with us here and now. I invite you to sing our first carol with us at home, O Come All Ye Faithful.
book of Isaiah. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance or make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Now would you please join us in singing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. To Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Will you please join me in an attitude of prayer? Lord Jesus, this Christmas will not be what we expected. But then again, your arrival was not what was expected either. Like Mary and Joseph, help us to find the joy in our confounded expectations. Like the shepherds, teach us to spread the gospel wherever we are. Like the angels, give us the words to sing. We pray for all those who need your special care tonight, for surely you are with them just as much as you were in Bethlehem all those years ago.
A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn.
A reading from the Gospel of John. The Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through Him, nothing, not one thing, came into being without Him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, and the darkness could not put it out. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Let us, let us pray. God, in these next moments, I do ask that you would help us to be present to you, even as you are always present with us. In these next moments, I ask that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that you would work and move in such a way that they would be made acceptable in your sight. I pray this in the name of Christ who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we put our Christmas tree up early this year, earlier than we put it up any other year. It was a couple weeks before Thanksgiving that my wife, Leslie, said to me, Andy, go up in the attic and get the Christmas tree. And I have to be honest with you, I grumbled a bit as I walked up those stairs and went into the attic and dug it out, drug the tree down, put it up, plugged it in, and of course, most of the lights twinkled, but there was that middle section that just refused to twinkle. We got that fixed, and then we decided after that that we were going to put lights on the house too, which was a big move for us. We haven't put lights on the, ho on the house for years. In fact, since we lived in Evansville, we've never put lights on our house. It was back in Tell City and Darlington, even and before that, um, that we put lights on our house. But we have not put lights on our house in Evansville. But this year, we decided to put lights on our house. And after four or five target runs, I had enough lights that I needed to finish my project. I hung them on the gutter, and then I decided I was going to hang them on this big gable, and so there I was, like Clark W. Griswold, on top of the roof, waving to the neighbors as they went by, and Leslie was standing on the ground underneath. I, I asked my wife, Leslie, what are you doing standing there? She's like, well, if you fall, I'm going to break your fall. I was like, no, if I fall, I'm going to break you. Just get out of the way. I put all the lights up, and we got that done. It looked great. And then came the ornaments. We pulled our big box for the ornaments out, and each one of the ornaments told a story. Leslie and I, we've been married for 12 years now, so 12 Christmases. And we've accumulated ornaments from people, people from the churches that we've served, people from the congregations we've been a part of, and in each and every ornament, to me, they have a name. It's about the person and the family that gave me those ornaments. And after I put all the ornaments on the tree, it was clear to me that we were surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. After it was all over, I asked my wife, Leslie, why the rush? Why were you in such a hurry to get all the Christmas stuff up this year? And without even skipping the beat, she looked at me and she said, Andy, I just, I just needed something to look forward to. That stuck with me. That just stuck with me since middle November. I just needed something to look forward to. I think deep down we're all looking for a, a happy ending. We're all looking for hope. That's what I love about the gospel lesson you just heard from the Gospel of John. John boldly declares that hope was woven into the very fabric of creation even from the very beginning. That's why I love to hear that gospel lesson read every Christmas. John proclaims boldly that, that hope is part of this world, even from the very start. He starts his gospel in a curious way. John does. There are no shepherds. There are no angels. There's no Mary or Joseph or Jesus or an inn. None of this. John begins with the phrase, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Greek word used for word is logos. Basically, it meant the creative force that holds the entire universe together. A helpful translation of the word would be like big picture. Instead of word, just insert the phrase big picture. In the beginning was the big picture, and the big picture was with God, and the big picture was God. And the big picture, the big picture that the gospel proclaims and Jesus confirms is this. In the midst of death, there is life. In the midst of darkness, there is light. Even from the beginning, our world has been designed with a happy ending. And Jesus comes to confirm this. The way this all works in our everyday lives, quite honestly, is God doesn't really rescue us from our pain. But what God does do is join us in the midst of it and calls forth and brings forth new life out of those ashes and out of the pain and out of the suffering we go through. It's almost like a a constant interchange between loss and renewal. Loss and renewal. Certainly, we've had a lot of loss this year. This year is unprecedented. I don't have words to describe 2020. Don't have them. Don't have words to describe what the folks of this congregation have been through. We've said goodbye to a lot of people. Everything's changed. The way we shop changed. The way we gather for holidays changed. The way we gather for worship on Christmas shifted. I'm being nice. It's different. And not all of us has respond to this loss in the same way. Some of us are angry. Some of us are sad. Some of us are numb. And yet the gospel's invitation in the midst of this loss that we're all going through is this. Forgive. I mean, that's what Mary and Joseph did. Joseph first forgave Mary. Mary, let's be honest, had to forgive God. And as a result of their forgiveness, what happened? Christ was born. Christ was born. And the same is true for us. We are invited to forgive the world and life, ourselves and one another, for not being what we wanted it to be. And when we do, that creates a vacuum for the love of God to burst forth in our hearts and renew us from the inside. This hope, this message, this proclamation is what Christmas is all about. It's woven into all the little rituals and all the little things that we do all throughout the season. From the fact that we celebrate the birth of Jesus in the midst of the darkest and coldest time of year to the fact that we put up evergreen Christmas trees to remind ourselves that there's light even light and life even in the midst of the dead of winter it's signified and symbolized in the way that we light all the candles of the advent wreath in almost like a march like way to remind us that Christmas will come and nothing will stop it. I even read one interesting ritual I never heard of this year. There was one professor by the name of Robertson Davies who every year told a ghost story at Christmas. A ghost story, which is a shocker, I know. I mean, during this time of year, we're supposed to talk about light and life and birth and songs and candy and all these kinds of things. But here this professor was in the middle of his university every Christmas telling ghost stories. And everyone would come and they would lean in to listen to hear what he had to say. Finally, someone asked him, Professor Robertson, why do you tell ghost stories? 
his response was, we live in a world that's crazy to know that there's more to it than what we see. There's more to it than what we see. Well, don't get too excited. I don't have any ghost stories for you tonight. But I agree with him. Christmas proclaims that there's more to the world than what we see. I don't just say this because it's a good idea. I say it because I've experienced it in my own life. And it dawned on me a couple days ago, I was out jogging and running, and it dawned on me that it's 20 years ago this Christmas that I had the worst Christmas 20 years ago than I ever had. It was 20 years ago Christmas that on the day after Christmas, I went to jail. Went out with some friends that, that spring and summer. What started as a fun time went horribly wrong, horribly wrong. And I was sentenced to 30 days in jail. Started the day after Christmas. And I remember that Christmas very vividly because while everyone else was counting down to Christmas, I was hoping that time would stop. Well, I went, I checked myself in. My cellmate was a good guy, his name was Brent. He was an opioid addict who made some poor choices. And I'll never forget the night he looked at me and he said, Andy, there's something about you. I wanted to say, tell me about it. <laughs> he said, there's something about you though. You, you seem like you marched to the beat of a different drummer. What's up with you? I assured Brent that there was nothing particularly special about me. But then I told him a couple months earlier, I'd become a Christian. Well, how did you do that, he said. I said, well, you know, to be honest with you, I've gone to church my whole life, but I really don't know how I really did it. I just prayed, God, help me. He thought for a moment and he said, would you pray with me? I was really anxious now. <laughs> I hadn't prayed with anyone since my mom and that was when I was six years old. So there's a little time that had passed between those two moments. I was a little rusty in my ability to pray with other people. But we prayed together. And as we prayed together, Christmas entered the room. It was a palpable presence. There was no doubt that we were not alone. I mean, that there was someone or something else there with us that night. Probably better said, instead of Christmas entering the room, we entered Christmas. Over the years, I've told that story less and less. I don't know why you just get to a point where you don't want to tell people that kind of stuff about you. But it seems like it connects to this year when everything is kind of locked away. As I told that story over the years, people would always say stuff to me like, boy, I sure am sorry that kind of thing happened to you. And I don't mean this to be snarky, but my response was, I'm not. I'm not. 30 days in jail taught me more than any Bible study, any seminary class, anything, for that matter, when it came to having a relationship with God. I learned through that experience that you don't learn grace by doing it right. You learn grace by doing it wrong. I learned through that experience that there's no cell that can hold back the presence of God. No darkness that will hold back the presence of God. I learned there's always hope. A few days ago, Pastor Jillian was leading this study, Zoom study. She posed the question, 
how come Jesus hasn't come back yet? She told me there was an awkward silence. People didn't know what to say. But then finally, someone spoke up and they said, maybe he has returned, but we just didn't notice. My prayer for us during this sacred season is that we would not miss Christmas. That we would not miss hope that we would remember that our God meets with us at the corner of poverty and despair over and over again. My challenge to us this Christmas is to grieve with expectation and know that in the midst of loss, there is renewal. My challenge is for us to, to lean in and listen to the voice of promise. And I promise you, Christmas will come. It will bubble up from the inside like a, a burst of love. Your circumstances will not change. But your attitude towards your circumstances will. And you and I will glow with hope. Not because of anything we've done because of the one who lives in us. Amen. And amen. It's at this time in the service that I typically take my little white candle and everyone else typically takes their little white candles. And we light the candle. Well, I light my candle first. And I say a few pastory things. And then I walk down here and I hand it off and it just goes throughout all the sanctuary. The lighting of this candle is a moment of celebration. But this year it's not. This year I light this candle as a way to pray. And I pray that the glow of God's presence meets you wherever you're at this year. And I pray that Christmas finds you wherever you're at this moment. Just as I've lit this candle, I pray that the fire of God's love burns in your heart. And I pray that God's presence is known to you, even as we hear the familiar carol with a twist this year, Silent Night.
You know, it's odd to know what to say to an empty sanctuary. Well, I preach to the choir tonight, (laughs) literally. (laughs) It's hard to know what to say when you look out and everything seems so different. But here's what I will say, thank you. I wanna say thank you to every single person who made this night possible, but especially I wanna thank thank Don Travis. He he deserves it. He deserves our gratitude tonight. (laughs) And I wanna thank every person that watched. Because you know, honestly, it's not a gift unless it's received and it takes people to receive the things that we offer. And so thank you to every single person who watched this. Merry Christmas.